All right. So welcome to the final Newland series program of 2022. Uh, my name is Laura Aidy. I am the Programs and Administration Manager at Newland Grist Mill. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the site, uh, we are a privately run nonprofit park in Delaware County, Pennsylvania. Uh, our site includes 160 acres of land, over eight miles of trails, and a historic area with a 1704 Grist Mill at its center. Uh, the Newland series uh, is a program that is a way to explore topics that relate to our dual mission of history and nature. Uh, and we feature both outside experts uh, like tonight, as well as Newland Gristmill staff. Uh, and this year, the full series is sponsored by Team Toyota of Glen Mills. Uh, if you have questions during the talk, uh, you can go ahead and type them into the Q&A or into the chat, and uh, we'll have some time at the uh, end of the presentation uh, to, to read those out and ask any questions that you have. Um, so tonight's program focuses on the environmental side of our mission, um, and particularly on um, conservation and restoration of uh, tree species, which is something that we uh, do in the park uh, with things like the American chestnut, uh, Don Redwoods. And tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Tara Trammell, uh, is going to be speaking about um, the efforts to restore the American elm um, to urban landscapes. So I will turn things over to you, Tara. Um, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Well, give me just one second to start my slides. All right. Well, good, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, very happy to be here this evening to talk about the research that I do on tree planting and reforestation efforts in cities. And my research program includes work on restoring iconic and native tree species to urban landscapes. Tonight, I'm gonna to focus most of my talk on um, the Native American elm, but I will also introduce some of the efforts that I'm doing to help promote oak establishment in urban forests. Um, just uh, for a second, Tara, um, we have the view with the like uh, preview up. Oh, here we go. How about that? There we go. Perfect. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, so first I want to start with um, talking about a region in more of a global context. And so I like to use this nighttime view of Earth because we can see visually where our most populated regions are in the world. Um, and in fact, 25% of the world's population resides in China, Europe, and the United States. If we also look at this map of the temperate deciduous forests, we see that there's a strong overlap between where um, a large part of the global population is, a quarter of it, and this forest biome. And if we zoom in a little bit more into our region on the eastern seaboard, especially between um, Boston and Washington, we see that this is a really highly populated region of the United States. It's sometimes called the Boston Wash Megalopolis. Um, and it's home to about 52 million people with a really high um, population density. So about a fifth of our US population lives in this corridor. Um, and underlying all of this urban development is the temperate deciduous uh, forest biome. So it's really important for us to maintain and restore our urban trees and forests for this really large urban population. Um, because we know trees and forests can provide a lot of benefits and help make our cities more sustainable and livable. But at the same time, our urban environments are also experiencing a lot of um, sort of stressors or changes to the conditions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the um, most consistent and well-documented changes that we see. And first, I'll be talking about the abiotic or what are considered like the non-living changes in our urban environments. And the first one um, has been, is been well-measured uh, phenomenon in cities across the world. This is the urban heat island effect. Um, and this is where temperatures are elevated in city centers relative to their nearby rural areas. And depending on the season or the time of day or the type of biome, this temperature difference could be as high as like 10 degrees um, or even more. And so it's, our cities are, are much warmer. 
We also see lots of changes in carbon and nitrogen due to fossil fuel combustion. So from cars and from industry, um, and that's, this has been called the urban CO2 dome effect where you have lots of carbon, um, especially carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in cities. And you see greater nitrogen deposition too. And so all of these things can really influence how trees and forests grow and respond to the urban conditions. They're warmer, they're getting more carbon dioxide for photosynthesis and more nitrogen for growth as well. But our cities, they are highly densely populated regions. So they can also be points of entry for non-native species um, that can become invasive. So we see a lot of biological invasions in our urban areas as well. So this can result in um, shifts in species composition. And also when we have pests or pathogens come in with invasions that can have a large influence on our trees and our forests as well. So all of these sort of environmental changes combined can influence how trees and forests function in urban landscapes and influence how we plant and manage trees and forests. And so understanding how they may respond to these conditions can be really important for moving forward, especially with tree planting efforts. So in addition to all of those kind of influences, we also have direct impacts from humans um, by that can cause mortality. And a lot of that is through construction. Um, so people will remove trees if they are in you know, conflict with construction that has to happen. Sometimes trees are removed because they also could pose a risk to people or property. So sometimes they're just removed for those purposes. We also are seeing a lot of mortality due to extreme weather events, um, and those are increasingly becoming more frequent. So these can also you know, cause changes to our urban trees and forests as well and influence um, our tree planting. And also um, we need more tree planting efforts because trees are under um, a lot of sort of changed environmental conditions and there's you know, mortality as well. So there's a lot of tree uh, planting campaigns that have been happening for in some cities for decades. Um, more recently, the goals of these campaigns are to help balance sort of environmental justice issues we see of tree canopy cover, and also to think about uh, climate adaptation, how we might be able to offset urban heat island or flooding that's um, projected that's currently happening sometimes due to extreme weather events or is uh, projected to continue to happen. So with these tree planting efforts, one of the things that um, I've been working on in conjunction with the Forest Service is thinking about how to restore sort of iconic um, urban trees to our urban tree canopy. Um, trees that used to be prevalent in our cities and towns but have now been lost. And the one I'm gonna focus on for the majority of this talk is the American Elm. So we know that um, in the early to early mid 1900s, most of the elm population was decimated across the United States due to Dutch elm disease. And most planting efforts after those collapse of that population, um, a lot of times non-native elms were planted in place of those native elms that we lost. Um, and there were also some efforts to combine native elms with non-natives to produce elms that were resistant to Dutch elm disease, but they weren't purely native um, American elms. And the reason to sort of think about um, bringing back this tree is because it was a really large shade tree. It also had um, sort of a visual characteristic that was very, a lot of people identified with in our cities and towns, but it's also a tree that was resistant or tolerant of drought, cold stress, salt, pollution, a lot of things that can happen in our urban environments. So um, there have been a lot of efforts within, especially the Forest Service, to uh, develop um, genotypes of American elm that are purely native, but also can withstand or tolerate Dutch elm disease. So I've been working with the Forest Service, and there are a couple of different places where they do this, but I've been working with the group out of Delaware, Ohio, and they have a breeding program that's been going on for about 40 years um, where they've been crossing what are called surviving elms. So these are elms that were exposed to Dutch elm disease that survived, American elms, that, and they survived in the landscape. So they cross those with other strains of elm trees, Native American elms that were showing uh, some resistance. And so they created these sort of purely Native American elms that are showing high tolerance to Dutch elm disease. 
And the way they test it is they'll actually inoculate all these different kinds of American elms that they've bred with DED. And then we've selected the ones that were the most um, tolerant of DED to use in our planting efforts. So these are genotypes or native genotypes. And that just means that they are genetically unique elms that are purely native and they've shown the strong resistance to Dutch elm disease. So a lot of their initial efforts in you know, planting this tree were set in sort of non-urban areas for reforestation efforts. So in riparian areas or other areas where they wanted to um, do some large tree plantings. But now we're working to also bring this um, tree back to our cities and towns. So in collaboration with the Forest Service, we are introducing these elms to more harsh, what we consider harsh urban conditions um, to help build our potential use of this species in, in our urban plantings and in reforestation efforts as well. So this picture is a, a graduate student of mine, a master's student, Danielle. She was also awarded the Garden Club of America a Fellowship in Urban Forestry in 2020 to help support a lot of this work that we did. So we had a couple of um, short-term and long-term goals for our project. Um, so first we wanted to see if we could establish this sort of elm and study how the early establishment phase, so in the first year um, of growth, you know, how these elms were doing, especially these particular native genotypes. And these were pure Native American elms. So we wanted to see how they could withstand these sort of harsh urban conditions as well. And long term, we want to sort of help restore American elms to cities and also assist um, native regeneration, tree regeneration in urban forests where they're currently experiencing mortality of other species. So for planting this tree in our cities, we selected three cities. So Newark, Delaware is where um, Forest Service Sciences uh, is stationed that I work with. We also have partners in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania with the Forest Service. And then close to Delaware, Ohio, we used uh, Columbus, Ohio to plant these trees. So we selected these three cities to plant these elm trees. I'm only gonna be talking about Newark and Philadelphia tonight as far as what we saw in the first year of growth. And that's because um, we planted them in the November of 2019. And then as we all know, COVID happened in 2020. And so in the summer of 2020, my graduate student was unable to travel to Columbus to do the measurements that we did here in Philadelphia and Newark. So within each city, we selected 15 different sites. And these sites ranged in the types of temperatures that we measured. Um, in their area, we also uh, had these sites range in a, the amount of impervious surface surrounding them. So we wanted to pick sort of a, a sites that were across the sort of urbanization intensity gradient. So we, sit, we picked 15 different sites in each city. So with the three cities, we had 45 sites total. And then at each individual site, we planted three trees. These three trees represented three different genotypes. They were all the pure Native American elms, but they, and they were um, the three that were shown to be quite resistant to, or tolerant, so, excuse me, tolerant to the Dutch elm disease. And so these were all um, clones. So each individual tree, they all were genetically the same. So they were clones that were grown in pots, like as you can see in this um, bottom right-hand picture. And so we had three different types that we planted at each individual site. So in each city, we had 45 trees. So during our tree planting, we had these, they were about two-year-old clones that were grown in those pots. And that's what we planted out. We watered them and we planted them. Um, but we also used this new approach um, uh, to water the trees consistently over time. A lot of times um, tree planting efforts, you know, the mortality, the high mortality rates we see are due to water stress. So we wanted to supply um, consistent water to all the trees um, so that this would not be sort of the major stressor for them. So we use something that's called um, a tree diaper. Um, and the, the unique aspect of using these is that um, they, you fill them with water and then place them around the base of the tree. So it looks like this black donut around the base of this tree but it can absorb precipitation or rainwater. And so as long as they're sort of full and holding water, then they're constantly supplying, keeping the soil moist for the tree. And so you don't have to go around to all these different sites watering the trees over time. Um, and so 
this can help with sort of getting them through drought times and also maintain that water supply. We also then put fencing around each tree to protect them from deer browse because they were very young, small trees. Um, so we, that's how we um, planted them. And so in all across all of the three cities, we had 135 trees total. So to try to understand how these trees were responding to these urban environments in the first year, we did a couple different plant level measurements. Um, the first one was looking at the whole tree. And we did this in the fall of 2020, so a year after our planting. And we looked at mortality, so just how many trees did we have that survived over this um, first year of growth. And then we also wanted to assess their actual growth. So we measured um, their tree height um, when we planted them and then one year later. And we also measured the diameter or the size of the tree trunk. And we did this at two different heights on the tree. So we did it about 30 centimeters from the soil and 137 meters from the soil. That's about one foot from the ground and about four and a half feet from the ground. We measured the size of the tree trunk. And then we did all those measurements again one year later in the fall of 2020. But to try to understand these differences that we might see at the whole tree level and their growth and mortality, we also wanted to look at things at the leaf level. And so we picked this, several different measures. The first one was measuring sort of um, chlorophyll, which is the pigment in leaves that um, drives photosynthesis. And we looked at a couple different measures of that. And these can provide indicators of stress the tree might be experiencing before you actually see visible signs of stress. So that's why we took a couple of those measures. We did this in the summer of 2020. So in their first sort of full growing season out in these urban sites. We also looked at different types of leaf chemistry. So we wanted to see nutrient levels in the leaves, potentially heavy metals that might be influencing some of their function. And we also looked at carbon and nitrogen because they're really important for driving photosynthesis and growth as well. So we looked at the carbon and nitrogen content, but we also looked at stable isotopes. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail about stable, stable isotopes, um, but they can tell you things about the sources, like where that carbon's coming from, where the nitrogen's coming from. And that can be really important, especially in cities, because you might be able to pick up a signature coming from um, fossil fuel combustion. But they can also give you indications of how the plants are functioning or what the soil nitrogen availability is. And all of these things can influence how the plants are growing in that first year. We also wanted to sort of measure some of the environmental conditions around the trees as well. So we had, you know, the urbanization gradient they were on, but we also wanted to measure some things a little more locally, especially the soils. Soils are really important to tree um, functioning and survival. So um, it, for each individual tree, we collected three samples using an impact core, and we analyzed the soil for bulk density, which is like an indication of compaction in the soil. We looked at the pH, organic matter, nutrients, heavy metals, all kinds of things that we thought would um, sort of be influencing the plant function. And then to look at above ground conditions, we, use, we just looked at ozone concentrations, and we kind of did this as a indicator of um, maybe above ground pollutant stressors. Um, and so we focused on that. We used what are called a passive sampler. Um, and in this picture, you can see my graduate student putting them out. And um, it's a more expensive and intensive type of measurement. So we did it in a subset of our sites across each city to just try to get a range of ozone concentrations that they might be experiencing. And we measured this in the summer as well over a two week deployment. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how our trees did. And so after the first year of growth, um, we were really happy to see that we had pretty low mortality. So we, we only lost four trees out of the almost 100 we had just between Newark and Philadelphia. And so we had really nice survival. And because so many of the trees did well and survived, we were able to test a lot of differences across the elm genotypes and across the two cities. Um, I'm not going to talk in too much detail about the differences we saw in the genotypes. Um, we originally thought we might not see very many differences because they performed similarly in garden trials um, before we put them out in the landscape, but uh, we did see some differences in how they responded um, in the first year. I'm going to focus on talking about the differences we saw between the cities because that can give us more of an indication of how these urban conditions are really influencing tree growth and survival, especially these elms. But before I get into that, I just want to mention that um, 
The four trees that we lost, we also replaced them in the fall of 2020, and some of them are still doing um, well. Um, but we wanted to try to keep three trees at every site, and hopefully, um, since they'll be there long term um, in, in our urban landscape. So. So I'm first gonna just show you a little bit of data that talks about the size of the trees. Um, so this is just comparing Newark and Philadelphia. So Newark is on um, the left and Philadelphia on the right. And the top line is showing the height of the tree. And then the next two lines are showing the size of that uh, the tree trunk at two different heights on the tree. Um, and the only differences we saw were that Philly was uh, significantly um, had larger tree trunks after one year of growth. Um, at that one foot uh, side or distance from the soil. And so the trees had grown um, more or they were larger at that um, spot on the tree trunk. And then if we looked at how they changed over time, so the actual growth rate. So I'm going to focus on the height, the growth rate of the tree trunk, both at one foot and four and a half feet from the ground. And we saw that um, the Philadelphia trees, their growth was enhanced. They had greater um, change in the height and greater change in the growth of the tree trunks. Um, and we had originally expected to see um, that the trees growing in Newark would be um, healthier, or have greater survival and growth because we thought they would be experiencing less stress. And so when we measured this after a year and we saw how well the, the trees were doing in Philly, it was, it was quite interesting. But um, now we looked at those sort of leaf level measurements to see if we could sort of explain maybe why during this first year they're doing um, what seems like they're doing well in Philly compared to New York to Newark. So I'm going to um, first show you in this figure, this is the data that looks at sort of that photosynthetic capacity or those chlorophyll measures in the leaves. So um, the yellow bars that are on the left are for Newark. The blue bars on the right are for Philadelphia. The two panels on the top are for the July time period. In the middle, it's for August. And on the bottom, it's for September. So we're first going to look at um, the, the differences between Newark and Philadelphia in July. And what we saw is that there was greater photosynthetic capacity in July. And some of our other measures suggest that this may have been due to more resource availability. So we saw higher nutrient levels in the soil in our Philadelphia soils. Then we also saw that there was significantly higher sort of photosynthetic capacity in the trees growing in Philadelphia, also in September. And this could also be due to greater resource availability but it might also be due to what's called altered phenology. So phenology is the timing of growth and reproduction in, in um, organisms throughout a growing season or throughout a year. And what we, you know, in Philadelphia or in cities, a lot of times what we see is extended growing seasons. So it's possible that what we're starting to see here is the later growing season or, you know, the, con the sort of more continual growth happening in Philadelphia compared to Newark. Um, due to warmer temperatures and that sort of altered phenology response. And that what we're starting to see in New York is some of that senescence starting a little earlier. So now I wanna talk a little bit about some of the leaf chemistry that we saw um, in these trees. And I'm first gonna focus on the carbon stable isotope. And so I just wanna um, talk about how um, the differences between what we saw in Newark and Philadelphia, again, Newark is in yellow and Philadelphia is in blue on the left. And what we saw was that Philadelphia um, was significantly lower in the carbon stable isotope. And this can mean two different things. The first is that it could mean that the CO2 that the plant is accessing or taking in for photosynthesis, more of it's coming from fossil fuel combustion. Or it could mean that there's changes in the stomatal conductance. And that's the openings on the base of the leaves that sort of let the CO2 into the leaf for photosynthesis and where it loses water. And so sometimes if you see differences in that, that will drive this drop. But since we had similar moisture availability to all of our trees across all of the cities, we really think that this is due to sort of that CO2 urban dome effect that we, I talked about in the beginning that maybe they are experiencing more CO2 from fossil fuel combustion, so that greater CO2 availability, and that's helping sort of fuel more photosynthesis. 
And then if we looked at the nitrogen, we saw that in Philadelphia, that's also in blue on the left, there was greater nitrogen concentration and greater nitrogen stable isotopes. And what this suggests is that um, they could be accessing nitrogen also from um, fossil fuel combustion sources. So a lot of times there are higher levels of um, nitrogen in cities just because of that. But also sometimes that stable isotope is higher because it's coming from a fossil fuel source. But it also can indicate more nutrient cycling happening in the soil. And so there might be just more nitrogen availability um, for the trees in Philadelphia compared to Newark. Now we did a follow-up study where we looked at some other measures of nitrogen to try to answer this question, um, but we haven't gotten to analyzing the results yet, but we're hoping to sort of narrow in and focus in on whether there is this real difference in nitrogen availability to the trees that might be explaining some of those growth pattern differences that we saw. So I just wanted to show a few pictures of these elm trees um, after the first year, just to give you this visual. Um, so in these two pictures, um, we have Newark on the left and Philadelphia on the right. And I tried to size the pictures so that the cages were about the same size. So we're looking at sort of a similar perspective of both of these trees. And both of these trees were um, planted in, on similar conditions too. They're both on campuses. So the tree in Newark is on the University of Delaware's campus. And the tree in Philadelphia is on the University of Pennsylvania's campus. And so we can see that even though they're sort of in similar types of landscapes within these cities, that the Philadelphia tree really is much larger and it was growing quite a bit more. And again, I tried to show the same scale as much as I could with these two pictures. And in these two pictures, both trees are planted more adjacent to um, paved areas that have light traffic. Um, and once again, you can see the tree in Philadelphia is much larger, much taller, and, and has grown quite a bit more. And you know, we've been out to see the trees um, since the first year, and we still continue to see this trend of the trees in Philadelphia are just growing quite a bit, um, and much more so than the trees in Newark. And I didn't get into talking a lot about some of the other leaf chemistry measurements or the soil chemistry that we measured because we didn't see a lot of um, relationship between what was in the leaves and what was in the soils. And this could be just because during that first year of growth, the tree roots really weren't accessing a lot of that soil around it because it was in a pot. And so when we planted them, the roots had a lot of the potting soil still with them. Um, and they may have started to get into that soil a little bit, but maybe not a lot. So we're going to be tracking these trees over a long term to not only look at their longevity, but look at their long-term growth patterns and we will also be taking some similar types of measurements um, a few years down the road after they've had some time to grow and get accustomed to these sites to see how some of these measurements that we took after the first year of growth may change over time. And this will help give us information about maybe recommendations for types of landscapes that they do well. Um, it could just be that there is differences between the site types that we planted in Newark. Some of them had higher heavy metals. We've also seen this in some of our forest patches that we've studied in Newark compared to Philadelphia as well, that sometimes we're seeing higher heavy metal concentrations in the forest soils. Um, and I had another student, if anybody's interested, who did a study on red maple trees in the, between the two cities. And it also seemed like um, the trees in Philadelphia were showing adaptation to stress. And so they were actually doing well. So it's an interesting sort of pattern that we're seeing um, but it does suggest because we had low mortality, mortality in that first year that they could both do well in, in cities and in these conditions. So I wanna talk a little bit about another project that we're starting using American Elm. And this is more focused on reforestation efforts um, because we also wanna help cities who are, um, that are losing a lot of native forest canopy to other for other reasons. So as I talked about in the beginning, you know, there's a lot of environmental impacts. There's climate changes, you know, warmer temperatures in cities. There's um, changing precipitation patterns, but there's also the overall climate change happening. And these are all environmental impacts that can influence our urban forests. Um, there's also invasive pests, pathogens, plants that can um, cause, you know, either competition with our native trees or also just decimate some populations of our native trees. But in addition to those sort of 
stresses or you know environmental challenges in our forests, we also have what is called like an aging canopy. And this is just due to a lack of um, native tree regeneration that is happening in a lot of our forests. And this can be due to um, a lot to do to deer herbivory. And so we're seeing that while our forests have native tree canopy, for the most part, the majority of them are native. Um, the understory has a lot of non-natives in them in some of the forests, not all of them, um, but there is a lack of, of native tree regeneration. And so, and there's also, you know, future threats to our forests when um, we do see the, the adult trees that are native um, come down in our forests. And so when they come down or, or we see mortality of those trees and they form canopy gaps, um, it can be quite um, a challenge to the forest because you can lose trees due to storm damage or the invasive pests. But then a lot of times once that canopy gap forms, then what we're seeing is non-native plants come into the understory and not native tree regeneration. So our goal is to try to capture these canopy gaps and repel sort of plant invaders and promote that native tree regeneration. So a lot of our urban sort of reforestation efforts right now are happening in places where we either have canopy gaps or where there's been a lot of canopy loss due to particular pests. And so, you know, a lot of our managers are focused on um, the gaps because it, traditionally, if you have a tree come down and form a canopy gap in a forest, it would just help promote, you know, the trees that were in the sort of seedling or sapling stage because they're getting more light to grow up back into the canopy. And so you would get this natural regeneration and sort of this healthy sort of um, cycle of the forest. But now because we get a lot of this non-native invasion instead, um, and we also have deer browse on many of the native trees, these canopy gaps can be quite problematic. And we're seeing a lot of them due to pests. And one of the pests that's um, extremely problematic right now is the emerald ash borer. At least in our region, it's problematic now. It was first discovered um, in Michigan about 20 years ago, and it devastated the ash population in Midwestern states um, for, for a long time, for decades, it's been doing that. It was um, identified in New England about 10 years ago and is now in the mid-Atlantic. And we're seeing a lot of mortality of our ash trees due to that. It depends on where you are in the mid-Atlantic, um, maybe five years, but I know for um, the uh, Newark, Delaware, where I am, a lot of that mortality is happening sort of now. So we're sort of asking the question about, well, can we plant some of these native American elm trees um, that are resistant to Dutch elm disease or tolerant to Dutch elm disease now, can we use that to help capture some of these areas where we're having substantial ash tree loss? So once again, in partnership with our Forest Service scientists at Delaware, Ohio, so the first time we used, you know, clones of genotypes to plant in pots, um, but there are you know, some challenges to always working with potted plants when you're doing tree planting. So we wanted to try growing them from seed um, so that they're sort of growing not from a cutting, but from a seed with that really strong root um, formation. And so there were elm seeds that were collected from genotypes that were demonstrating resist, uh, resistance and tolerance to DED. Um, and so we got lots of seeds from our partners um, and they had done a sort of preliminary test to see how they germinated. It didn't, they didn't have a lot of uh, germination. So we were, we didn't know what we would find, but we planted all of these seeds um, in soil trays, which is the picture I'm showing on the right here is a soil tray. We just spread out nice potting soil and put the seeds in. And this was done at the UD Fisher greenhouse complex. So we germinated, um, they started to germinate in early spring and in this picture on the left, you can see tiny little bits of green. So this is the, some of the elm seeds starting to germinate. Um, and then we got a flourish of germination. So those seed trays became almost entirely covered by little elm trees. And so then we transplanted them to containers so they could start to have um, more space and nice root development. Um, and now we have hundreds of elm trees, tree seedlings um, that we're going to use in a reforestation effort especially in a place where we're seeing ash decline right now. And so our plan this fall is to plant these elm seedlings. We have six different genotypes. Um, we're going to replicate it and do it across this um, forest area where there's lots of different microsite conditions with water, 
moist, you know, soil moisture, maybe nutrient content. So the different soil types, and we're going to plant these elms out and to see um, they how fast they grow, how well they do, and if they help sort of capture that site. Because if we plant these seedlings, um, we're going to take up some space that hopefully invaders plant, you know, non-native invasive plants don't get in and get a foothold. So in addition to doing this in the forest, we're going to do what's called a common garden experiment. This is going to be um, hopefully or on the UD farm. So what we do is we plant the same um, elm seedlings that we will put out in the forest. We're going to do it here um, in a place where they have lots of water and lots of sunlight so that we can start to test sort of differences in traits across those um, different genotypes. So we can see um, specifically like which species might grow taller or faster, have different traits in them. And then without as much variable environmental conditions like you would have in the forest. So that can help us sort of assess how those different um, trees are doing within the forest too, once you change those conditions. So it's kind of a way to test the, the different um, genotypes specifically. So we'll plant a lot of these trees in this common garden, and then you always put a border row of trees around the edge too. And so we're gonna plant maybe about 150 trees um, in this area. So in addition to the work I'm doing with you know, the Native American elm, I, we're also concerned with other native trees in our urban forests, especially um, that are not regeneration, regenerating naturally. Um, and oak is one that we're really focusing on because oak species are extremely important um, for biodiversity. They are an important component of our um, mature canopies, but they're not regenerating. And we're not seeing, so there's a lot of um, older, large trees, but we're not seeing um, saplings and seedlings coming up. And so we have a big partnership that we're doing up and down the East Coast in multiple cities with Forest Service scientists and a lot of municipalities and um, forest land um, managers. So we're gonna be planting um, chestnut and white oak seedlings. And this is going to be focused on planting them in canopy gaps in the urban forest. And so we have four cities, we're Springfield, Massachusetts, New Haven, Connecticut, Philadelphia, and Baltimore, where we have um, 10 canopy gaps in each city. And we're going to be planting out hundreds of these chestnuts and white oak seedlings um, in the spring. So um, in each gap, we'll have a couple, several hundred trees. In addition to that, we're also going to do this common garden study design like I talked about a minute ago with the elms. We're also doing that in three of the cities in Springfield, New York, and Baltimore, um, just to test sort of those differences in the trait across um, these, these plants or across all these oak seedlings that we'll be planting. So in total, we're going to be planting somewhere between 18 and 20,000 oak seedlings in the spring of 2023 up and down the East Coast in these gaps and in these common garden studies. Um, but well, so one of the things that we're really sort of focused on thinking about with this is not just how can we establish these oaks in these forests, but also thinking about um, climate change. So we want to capture these canopy gaps and study the oak seedling performance, but we also want to think about, um, you know, with assisted might with climate change coming, which trees might be able to do where, well where. And so we're doing what's called a provenance study. And that's where you're looking at a population of trees that grow from a specific place or origin, but then we're moving it to another place to test that. So what we did is we, we collected acorns across our um, region. So we did five of our cities, and we also have a southern source from Tennessee and from Kentucky. And so these are all white oak or chestnut oak trees. And we, so we collected from seven different trees in each um, seed zone. We had lots of partners up and down the East Coast that um, really got active last fall and helped us collect um, chestnut and white oak acorns. And we collected a total of like 100,000 um, acorns. And that should say fall of 2021 instead of fall of 2022. Sorry about that. So we collected the acorns last fall. And then what we did is we shipped them to Kentucky. So in Kentucky, there's a, the White Oaks Genetics Program, and this is um, from the uh, White Oaks Genetics Initiative. So it's a collaborative project um, that's to develop high quality white oaks 
for reforestation efforts throughout the Eastern United States. And so the goal, this is between um, the University of Kentucky, the Department of Forestry in Kentucky as well, um, a big partnership. And so the goal is to improve knowledge about the genetic characteristics and potential of white oaks um, from different places and how they fare when you move them to other locations. So um, last fall, after we sent them all of the uh, 100,000 oaks, acorns, they planted them, as you can see in this picture on the left, by hand, they plant all of those acorns in long rows um, and uh, tag them with those tags. And then they grow for a year. So they were planted last fall and they've been growing. So we will be have um, throughout this entire growing season. So I went to Kentucky this summer to see some of our um, oak seedlings. And we have approximately 30,000 uh, oak seedlings that emerged from those acorns. Um, in this picture, I'm standing in one spot and I'm looking to the picture at the left and then I'm looking to the picture on the right and those rows, there's three rows that are that long with oak seedlings. And so there's a lot of oak seedlings growing that we'll be bringing back to the East Coast to plant out. Um, and so this fall, or so yeah, they'll be growing through this fall. And then when they go into dormancy, we will lift them in the spring of 2023. So this picture on the left is showing like the attachment that you put on the tractor um, that helps lift the oak seedlings. So you lift them from the ground um, and then we will be bringing them back as bare root seedlings to plant next spring. So it's a very exciting project, a lot of different partners that are working on it. And it's gonna be um, something that we're hoping to use as a test and case studies to help sort of inform um, different aspects of, of oaks and what sort of traits help make them maybe faster growers or be able to get hold in those canopy gaps um, and how it may um, deter non-native invasive plants as well. So there's a lot of threats to our urban forests, like the invasive plants that I talked about. These are a couple of pictures just showing um, multiflora rose, which is all throughout our forests. And so uh, we see a lot of reduced native tree regeneration due to this in our forests. There's also a lot of deer pressure. Um, so even in forests where we don't have a lot of non-native invasive plants, sometimes we have no plants at all, um, especially like in these areas where we're planting the oaks, um, there's just no native trees regenerating. And then there's also the pests, you know, having um, an entire population of one particular tree species or genus like the ash trees be lost um, creates quite a big um, pressure in our urban forests. So focusing on uh, reforestation efforts is vital for protecting and maintaining our forests and cities, which are really important um, for providing benefits, uh, not only to residents, but other biota as well, especially like with the oak, it's really important for for biodiversity. So our research is sort of focused on restoring iconic species like the American elm, but also oak species as well, because um, they're both important for and support native biodiversity, um, and they also provide a lot of benefits um, to human residents as well. So this kind of type of large scale research also takes a lot of partnership, especially when we're working in our urban environments. And so um, I just want to focus a little bit on that the people are so important when it comes to working in these green spaces. Uh, we've had a lot of volunteer efforts. Um, there's a picture here showing um, this. I didn't talk about this very much today, but there's um, a forest in Baltimore that is associated with a church there. It's called the Still Meadow Peace Park. Um, and some of my Forest Service partners uh, have been working a lot there too. And it's really connecting with people and, and helping sort of focus on not just public lands, but our private lands too. Um, and helping with reforestation efforts is really important. And so we have this network across the Northeast to help share knowledge and sort of come up with ideas. So the, the Oak study was a co-produced study with land managers and scientists um, to try to help address all of these threats. And it's, you know, a lot of our urban forest managers are really trying to connect with the communities to help promote sort of urban reforestation and urban forest management efforts that that are beneficial and help build sort of this resiliency of our urban forests over time. So it's really important, people are important. So I just wanna acknowledge that I've had um, funding sources that have contributed to making this work happen and a lot of collaborators, um, especially with the Forest Service. So 
Vince D'Amico, Rich Hallett, Max Piana, Leela Pinchot, Nancy Santi, Laura Roman, and Charlie Flower, all four service scientists. Um, and so it's great to be working with them. And then I've had several lab, men lab members that have contributed to this work. I also want to point out that um, people who collaborate with us on their lands, so the Newark and Philadelphia Parks and Recs and the University, the University of Pennsylvania and Delaware, um, it's, it's really important to have these partners. And I also want to say that um, all of the uh, acknowledgements here are focused mostly on the ELM work that we're doing and the partnership that we have for the OAK. I can't quite fit on one slide, so I'll be growing that list over time, but we have a lot of partnerships. Um, and it's it's just, we really value that. So thank you so much. And I would be happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you, Tara. Um, this is really interesting. It's uh, interesting to get a slightly different perspective um, from some of the projects that we do in the park. Uh, where we're, we're doing very similar things, but uh, with the urban uh, aspect of your project that that's really interesting. Um, I have a question. Um, what exactly was or is Dutch elm disease? Is it like a fungus or how does it affect the tree specifically? Yeah, so basically, I, um, I'm not a plant pathologist, but my understanding is that there was like a, a beetle that um, transported the fungus and that it was a fungus that actually caused the disease in the trees. And there was like a first wave of it that happened in the really early 1900s. And then the second wave that came through is really what decimated the entire population of elms. So it kind of got hit twice. Um, yeah. Um, we also have a question from Michael Knight, um, who I will preface this with. He is one of our uh, historic woodworkers. Um, <laughs> he asks, will elm eventually become plentiful enough to be available in the timber market? Uh, he says that it's intertwined grain makes it ideal for high stress wood parts uh, like the hubs of wooden wagon wheels. Oh, wow. That's a great. That's a really interesting question. You know that would be that would be amazing to have happen at some point to have so much of it back that it could contribute to that industry. Um, one thing that I will mention that I that I think is really interesting. I was in Baltimore re earlier this week, and they have a, a whole project there. Like we don't have, um, I don't think in Delaware we have a mill that works. You know, and like can take some. So a lot of and a lot of cities don't have access to this. So the trees that come down just sort of get chipped. But there's a whole new a uh, project they have in Baltimore called Camp Small, where they're collecting all the trees that come down and they're getting turned into for woodworking projects and all kinds that they're, they're being sort of closing that loop and contributing it back into like markets. And it's really, it was an amazing um, project. And it would be great to see that happening more with cities too, because a lot of trees come down in cities, you know, and a lot of times they just get chipped up and um, that's, that's sad to see, but it'd be great to have enough elms back in the landscape that when they did come down, we could start to use them for, for things like that. So that's, that's a great, it's a great question and point. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a really interesting program. We have to look into that more. Yeah, yeah, it was <laughs> really fascinating. I think it's relatively unique, you know. Great. Um, let's see, um, Alex asks, is there an organization like the American Chestnut Foundation for Elms? Yeah, there isn't one like the American Chestnut Foundation for Elms. Most of this work is being done within the Forest Service. And so, yeah, there's not an organization like that that I'm aware of, um, but there's quite a few. There's, I think there was some work being done in Beltsville too, um, in other places um, besides just Delaware, Ohio. But there's just been a lot of research on the American elm within the Forest Service, but I don't know of any uh, other organization. I know there are some trees that are on the market, um, but their genetics are not as well understood. So they're sourced, um, they're Native American elms, but the source, like the, the genetics in their lines, and so we don't really know. Sometimes they do really well, and sometimes they don't do well at all. And so it's hard to decipher that or study that because they kind of have a mixed heritage, whereas the trees we're working with don't. So we can kind of really track it more carefully to understand how they're doing. I think there are some private 
um, like nurseries that have done it, but not like an organization like the American Chestnut. Um, oh, and uh, Michael followed up about the uh, timber uh, and milling. Uh, he says that there are private mills that do salvage local casualties in their communities. So that is something that's happening. Uh, George asks, um, what is the status of the elm trees along the campus walkway? And are your elm trees being used to replace the ones on the U of D campus? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, on especially on our green. So, you know, it was a historic sort of, landscape element to the green on UD's campus to have American elms. And they did all of them come down. Um, there are a few, there are a couple American elm survivors on campus, but not in the green area. And when they first came down, a lot of them were replaced with uh, Chinese elm or Japanese velcovas. And so recently, well, maybe not recently now, but maybe like four, four years ago or so, on the north part of the green, they did plant some Princeton elms. Um, and those are still doing pretty well. So I think over time, they may try to replace those with natives um, as, as they take some of those out. Um, but right now, a lot of them are still Chinese elm and Selkovas, which look very similar, but they're not quite the same. So. Um, our, uh, our staff naturalist, uh, Jessica, uh, asks, are you doing any preventative invasive plant management prior to planting the seedlings in canopy openings or just letting things grow as they will? Yeah, that's a great question. So for um, the upcoming work that we're, we're going to be doing with the oaks, we are going to sort of clear the gap because we have to, we're planting in so many oaks um, and most of these um, gaps if they have plants in them, a lot of them are non-native invasive. So we will be taking those out and then we'll be tracking it over time. And we may have to periodically do some maintenance um, to start to keep, especially if it's gonna be something that would um, hinder the growth of the oak trees. Yeah. Uh, and David asks, how do the elm and oaks fare against the spotted lantern fly? Oh, that's a good <laughs> question. Yeah, I haven't uh, noticed or heard that they're any worse off. I think that, you know, we know the spotter and lanternfly prefers Ilanthus, which is really nice, um, but it doesn't require, it's not, unfortunately, it's not a requirement for its life cycle. Um, but I haven't heard that it's preferentially picks either one of those species, and I haven't noticed it in our forests or on our elm trees that we've planted that they're experiencing any sort of pressure from the spotted lantern fly. Not yet. I mean, not from what we've observed, yeah. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, and, and our naturalist, Jessica, um, says we've not seen any spotted lantern fly activity on the three elms in the park at Newland, um, but have seen some casual activity of them on various oaks in the park. Uh, Marianne asks, is there enough funding to keep this effort going? Um, are there major furniture makers interested in encouraging restoration of various species, for example? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And, and, you know, I hadn't thought about that. So I know with like the White Oaks genetic program, you know, the bourbon industry helps support a lot of that. That's why there's sort of that program in Kentucky, because it's required for the oak barrels or the, you know, they use oak for the barrels for the bourbon. Um, so the funding so far has been coming from um, some of it from the Manton Foundation. So there is some private foundation interest in helping with these American elms that comes into the Forest Service. Um, and the Forest Service also puts funding into it. Um, but that's a good idea to think about like a actual industry that might be interested in it. I haven't heard of anything like that, but that's an interesting idea. <laughs> Food for thought. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I don't see any questions that haven't been answered, um, but uh, some bravos and thank yous and uh, people that have appreciated uh, your time this evening. Um, thank you so much for for coming and talking to us um, about the elms. This is fascinating. Uh, and uh, we'll look forward to keeping up with uh, what's going on with those projects. Um, and thanks everyone to who came out tonight. Um, 
we are done with our Newland series for the season, but we will um, have a new slate of talks uh, coming in 2023. Um, we will be posting the recording of this on our website. Um, so be on the lookout for that if you want to go back and uh, watch it again or uh, share it with somebody who you know would be interested in it. We also have recordings of our other uh, virtual Newland series programs up there as well. Um, and if you are local, we have our big Fall Harvest Festival, which is back for the first time this year since 2019. Um, it is coming up next weekend on Saturday, October 1st. So uh, if you're in the area, please uh, stop on by and uh, check it out. Uh, so again, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Tara. And uh, we'll see you all later. Have a good night. Thanks.